part fighting mad, his eyes blazing, its hissing head puffed high, part crippled, wounds cutting its pace, struggling in knots, twisting, twisting round itself. So, this is how epic similes work, remember? They got that long like and then all that long amount of words, and then, so, the ship lived in. Oars laboring slowly and still. She spreads her sails and enters the harbor, canvas taunt. Aeneas, glad that the ship is salvaged. This is significant because we're going to get four ships lost later in this book to fire. Crew restored, gives to Jesus the prize that he had promised. A slave girl, Polly, um, uh, born of Cretan stock, and hardly inept at Minerva's works of hand, nursing twins at her breast. So here we are, back to giving away slave girls again for prizes. Just like we saw in, of course, the Iliad, right? The second event after the boat race is a foot race, right? And the thousands, many thousands, we're told, are watching this one. Um, and then the names of all the different people who are going to compete. And then finally at 335 or so, um, uh, Virgil even inserts this line. Uh, many also competed, their names now lost in the dark depths of time. In other words, there's all kinds of, all kinds of competitors. Uh, Aeneas then will speak to the crowd. He'll tell us what the prizes will be. First place a horse, second place a boat, third place a helmet. And at line 350, uh, as soon as, uh, as said, they take their mark, ready, set, a sudden signal, go, and they break from the start, pouring over the course like a storm cloud, streaking on all ice, fixed on the goal, with Nicias far in the lead. And we'll have the same game being played that we saw when we studied Iliad 23, of the poet trying to create some tension by telling us how this one all goes down. Well, we have Nicias in front, at line 362, now down the stretch they come, the exhausted runners closing on the goal, when all at once, unlucky Nicias skids on a slick of blood they chance to spill, killing bullocks, soaking the turf and green grass surface. Here, the racer, elated, victory won, pressing the pace, he stumbles. Pitching face first in the filthy dung and blood of victims. In other words, he's running, running, running. They had killed some animals for sacrifice, and he steps in some of that gunk, and he slips and he falls and he falls face first, right, right into the dung and to the mess, right? But we're told he won't forget Eurydice, his his friend, his great love. Never up from the slime he struggles, flings himself in Salinas' path, who's at number two in the race to send him spinning, reeling backward, splayed out on the beaten track as Aeschylus finishes past, flashes past, thanks to his friend, he takes the lead, the victor flying along. In other words, the only way that, uh, that we, we will have Eurelius winning is because Nicias will knock off the second Salinas, and that's how it works. Now, you can imagine, Salinas is very upset, very much like Menelaus mad at Antiquilus, um, in Iliad 23, remember the son of Nestor, the young man, is going to cheat Menelaus out of his, out of his, uh, his trophy, right? Aeneas, we're told, uh, tries to seek a middle way. He gives a lion's hide um, um, to Salinas. Uh, you, you know, you were second and then you got knocked off or whatever. And Nicias then is very upset. He's like, wait a minute, I was the one in front and then I slipped and I fell. Look, look. And we're told that at line 397 or so, with each word, he points to the sopping muck that fouled his face and limbs. And we're told in a key line, the fatherly captain, Aeneas, smiled down at his friend and had them fetch a shield to give to him as a prize. We're back to that, that moment in Iliad 23, line 618, that we talked quite a bit about in that lecture, that uh, uh, Aeneas is starting to find his humanity in the moment that he smiles. And of course, Virgil is wanting to, us to play the exact same game. The third event is the boxing event, and it's a fascinating one because we have this guy named Darius. Darius stands up, and he is this a huge, immense young man, and he challenges anybody that will come and box with him. Nobody will pay, take him on. So he says to Aeneas, I should win the prize outright. The, the prize, by the way, is a bull um, with gilded horns and all of that. We then will have um, Achistes, um, the king, who will turn to Antullius, who is sitting there next to him at line 431, and he says to him sharply, Antullius, one of our bravest heroes, where is it gone? Look at this prize. How can you just sit back, feck, um, feckless, and let them cart it off without a fight? Where's that god of ours, that Eryx? Tell me, our teacher once, the one who taught um, you really is how to fight, right? Renowned for nothing now, 
Where's your fame that thronged all Sicily once? What are the trophies hanging from your rafters? We're told until he returns to his king. My love of glory, my pride still holds strong, not beaten down by fear. It's slow, old age. That's what dogs me now, sounding very much, of course, like Nestor in the Iliad, in the Iliad right? It's old age that dogs me now. My blood runs cold, my body's chill played out. In other words, I'm too old to fight and box anymore. But if I were now the man I was, full of the youth that spurs that, that bantam there, cocksure and strutting so, I need no bribe of a prize bull to bring me out. I have no use for trophies. However, he gets out his, the old gauntlets, which are these, you know, uh, you'd think of them as knights, the gloves, right? Those kind of metal gauntlets that you put on. And we're told this one has all kinds of blood and guts, men's brains all over it from where he in the past has won. He goes to Aeneas, old Antilius will speak, and he will say, you know what, I guess I, I guess I will go ahead and try this. We have the events before the fight. We have Aeneas, who will be the officiator. He's kind of the, 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 uh, the, the boxing ring referee, if you will. And they began. Uh, it's interesting that we're told Darius will trust the young man in his footwork, while Antilius will trust in force and strength. Antilius, the old man, will swing, he'll miss, he'll fall down. The audience, of course, is going to ooh and awe. Um, we've got the um, um, Achistes, the king, who is asking, rushing to his aged friend. He pities him, he asks him, and then we're told at line um, uh, 500 or so, the champion, never slowed by a fall and shaken, goes back to fight, and all the fiercer, anger fueling his power now, shame fires him up in a sense of his own strength. In other words, Antilius is having none of this now. He's, he's ready to prove one last time what kind of fighter he is. So, in a blaze of fury, he pummels Darius headlong over the whole wide we think immediately of a film like Rocky, we think of um, um, uh, Scorsese's uh, Raging Bull, any kind of boxing movie comes to mind here, right? D he pummels Darius headlong over the whole wide ring, lefts and rights, doubling blows, no lull, no let up, thick and fast as the hailstones pelting down from a storm cloud, rattling roofs so dense the champions blows, both fists pounding over and over, battering Darius reeling round, and then we're told at line 511, enough! Aeneas, the good captain, could not permit the fury, the blind rage of Antilius to rampage any longer. He stopped the fight, pulled the battle-weary Darius out of the bout, and consoled him with these words. Poor man, what insanity's got, in, got you in its grip? You're up against superhuman power. Can't you see the will of God's against you? Bow to God. Um, and they kind of cart poor Darius off, his head lolling side to side, spitting clots from his mouth, blood mixed with teeth. His maids called back, receive his sword and helmet, the, the second place went, leaving the bull in the victor's palm to Antilius. So you got this huge bull there now that Antilius is, uh, is given. Over overflowing with pride, glorying over his bull, the old champion shouts, Son of the goddess, see, you Trojans too, what power I had when I was in my prime, but from what a death you rescue Darius now. In other words, I was going to kill the guy if you guys hadn't pulled him off and saved him. And then we're told, with that, standing over against the bull's head, steadied there, the battle's prize, he drew the iron gauntlet back, the glove that he has on, and rearing up for the blow, swings it square between both horns, crushing the skull and dashing out the brains and dying, quivering down onto the ground, the great beast sprawls. He punches the bull in the forehead, and kills the bull to show what he could have done to Darius. And rising over it now, the champion's voice comes pouring from his heart. Here, Eryx, he, he reminds the, 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 um, the, the one who taught him how to fight. I pay your spirit a better life than Darius. Here in victory I lay down my gloves, my skill. In other words, he retires. Now a lot's going on, I think, in this scene. Most importantly, you, you, old, old age still can have its fight, right? In other words, you better be careful when you're a young man. Remember, going back to the Odyssey, right, when on the island of the Phaeacians in their games, Odysseus was made fun of, you'll remember, and he pitches that disc further than everyone else, just to prove. And I think this is an important element for the Roman poet Virgil, that even though we are going to celebrate the young, right, we have to remember that the old have their fighting spirit as well. Of course, Tennyson, when he plays the game of Ulysses, the poem, as we will study it later, that great dramatic monologue, 
he will say something very similar. Old age hath yet its honor and its toil. Death closes all, but something ere the end, some work of noble note may yet be done, not unbecoming men that strove with gods. The idea here is that an old man can beat a young man if you get him upset enough, right? The fourth event is the archery event. Of course, we saw this event in the uh, in the uh, uh, the games for Patroclus as well. And the idea is that you put a dove up on the top of a pole, and the dove's uh, foot is tied, and you're going to shoot it with an arrow. We do have the mention of the third place shooter, which is your Tyrion, um, who is the brother of the famous Pandarus. And we'll remember Pandarus from Iliad Four. He's the one that shot the arrow. Um, after we thought that we were going to have a truce and the whole war starts all over again. The first shooter is Hypicon, and Hypocon will, will shoot first, and he just shoots into the, into the timber mass that's, you know, that's stuck at, into the ground. Then we will have uh, uh, Mencius, who is a, a part of our boat race. Um, he, still even has his, he still even has his laurel on. And he will miss the bird, um, but he will hit the rope, right? And, uh, and, the, and the dove flies away. Then uh, Eurydon, the brother of Pandarus, will shoot and he hits, kills a flying bird. Now those of us who hunt with bow know that that is no small feat to be able to shoot a bird out of the air as it's flying. And that's exactly what he does. We're told at line 571 then, we're back again to this notion of how the old can be celebrated. That um, um, Achistes, the king, the old man, alone remained. And his prize lost. Obviously, the one who shot the bird wins. Still, he whipped an arrow high in the lofty air to display a seasoned art and make his bow ring out. Suddenly, right before their eyes, look, a potent marvel destined to shape the future. So the outcome proved when the awestruck prophets sang the signs to later ages. In other words, Virgil says, this story that I'm about to tell you, it's been told for a very, very long time because Achistes does something really significant. He shoots an arrow into the air. Flying up to the swirling clouds, the arrow shot into flames, blazing its way in fire, burning out into thin air, like lost, like the shooting stars that often break loose, trailing the mane of flames to sweep across the sky. Transfixed, we're, we're told at line 581, as you can imagine, the men of Troy and Sicily froze and prayed the gods on high. Nor did Prince Aeneas hold back from the omen. He embraces Achistes in all his glory heaping splendid gifts on the old man and urging, take them, Father, by this sign the great Lord of Olympus has decreed that you should bear off honors far from all the rest. We're told that, and, and, that Achistes is named the winner and that, um, that the young man, um, who uh, uh, Eurytum, who actually killed the bird, he's totally fine with this, never grudged Achistes this distinction. Right? Um, and this is significant as well. In other words, the Romans are being informed we are good losers. Even though we're winners, uh, he, he won. I still, I give place to the old man because the old man's arrow burst into flames. The end of the ceremonies is also significant. So we're done with our little, uh, with our little ga funeral games. But we're not quite done because we have Eupites, who is the bodyguard of young Ascanius at line 600, is told by Aeneas, Get the young boys together, and I want them to give the writing uh, celebration. Now, this can sometimes be translated as dance, but what it really is is it's kind of like war games of a kind, where the young men will ride out in formation on their ponies, and we will, in fact, have the order. The first one starting at line 620. The first one is little Priam, the noble son of Polites. Next, you will have Atias, who is uh, um, the source of the Latin Atians. So, in other words, Virgil's always reminding us of the origin of so much that's Roman happen, happening right here. And then finally, the last, we're told, the handsomest captain of them all comes, Aeolus, riding a mount from Sidon, radiant Di uh, Dido's gift, a memento of the queen, a pledge of her affection. Now, it's significant that I just want to go back for a moment to book there's a set of lines that I didn't spend much time with there because I knew I was going to come to them now. And those lines are, are, are with us at line 194 or so. When we're told that young Ascanius on the hunting trip that will get cut short because Juno will send the storm that will ultimately lead Ascanius' father Aeneas and Dido into a cave where they will make love and then start the whole tragic story. But we're told about young Ascanius, okay, deep in the valley 
rides his eager mount, probably the same pony he's on, and relishing every stride, outstrips them all. He rides his pony really fast. He loves to ride fast. Now goats, now stags, but his heart is racing, praying, if only they'd send among this feeble, easy game some frothing wild boar, or a lion stalking down from the heights, and tawny in the sun. This is Iulius, this is Ascanius. In other words, he is a young man who is driven by conquest and contest as well. We're told, here comes Iulius riding on this, the rest of the youngsters ride Sicilian horses. Old oh, Acastes gifts, the riders awed by applause, the Dardans give their fine dressage, delighted to see in their looks. Their, their own lost parents' faces. This is a brilliant line. As old people watch the young people on the ponies in celebration going through their maneuvers, they see again the old, uh, they're delighted to see in the young looks their own lost parents' faces. I think this is a brilliant line, and it speaks to the propedeutic didactic nature of the Aeneid itself. In other words, when old people go to like a ceremony, like for example the graduation that you will all attend, there's this moment when the old get to see the young, but they really see themselves in you as you are going through your rite of passage of graduation. Right? Um, this acting out of this display of war, by the way, we are told becomes a tradition at 657. This tradition of drill and these mock battles, Ascanius was the first to revive the ride when he girded Alba Longa around with ramparts, teaching the early Latins to keep these rites just as he and his fellow Trojan boys had done, and the Albans taught their sons, and in her turn, great Rome received the rites and preserved our father's fame, 661. The boys are now called Troy, their troop, the Trojan Corps. In other words, this is the idea that you've got some kind of a legacy that's handed down, and the young men are celebrated on their ponies, and it's kind of, uh, it's, it's, an, uh, you know, it's kind of an important uh, way to mark the young men. Well, we're told this is the end of the games. We're also told fortune has now another idea. It, t it turns against the Trojans. This will happen with Juno, who has had enough of all of this. She sends Iris come flying down, the goddess who is going to send messages, very much like Mercury at 670, arching down on her rainbow, showering iridescence, and no one sees the virgin glide along the shore past the huge assembly, catching sight of the harbor, all deserted now, and the fleet they left unguarded. They left their, their, their ships unguarded. But here, but there, far off on a lonely stretch of beach, the Trojan women wept for the lost Anchises. So you got this whole group of women who are not participating in viewing of any of this. They're down by the beach, down by the ships, gazing out on the deep, dark swells. They wept and wailed. How many reefs, how many sea miles more that we must cross, heart weary as we are. They cried with one voice, a city is what they pray for. All were sick of struggling with the sea. In other words, this is it. You have old women who have gone through absolute hell in the fall of Troy, then down to Carthage, and then finally here they are in Sicily, and they cannot believe collectively as a group that they're going to have to keep going. And so we will then have Iris taking the form of an old woman, Viore, who will say, you know what, let's go ahead and just, let's just build here at line 697. What prevents us from building walls right here, presenting our citizens with a city? Oh, my country, gods of the heart, we tore from enemies all for nothing, with no walls ever again be called the walls of Troy. We're never again to see the rivers Hector loved, line 700, the Samais and the Xanthos. No, come, she says, action. Help me burn these accursed ships to ashes. The ghost of Cassandra came to me in dreams. The prophetess gave me flaming brands and said, look for Troy right here, your own home here. Act now, no delay in the face of signs like these. You see, four altars to Neptune, the god himself is giving us torches, building our courage too. Well, we're told that the eldest Pyro, the, uh, once the nurse to Priam's several sons, calls out and says, It's not uh, Biori at all, you women of Troy. Um, I saw her back in the tent. Um, this is a goddess. And the women then are torn, we're told. And off goes Iris, cleaving a great rainbow, flying beneath the clouds. The women are dumbstruck, we're told, driven mad by the sign. 
They scream, some seize fire from the inner hearts, some plunder the altars. They all hurl at once, the god of fire is unleashed, and they begin to burn the ships. We're actually told now that Ascanius, the son of Aeneas, will see them. He comes riding up to them, remember he's on his pony at line 740 or so, and he says, Madness beyond belief. What now? What drives you on, wretched women of Troy? It's not the enemy camp, the Greeks. You're burning your own best hopes. Look, it's your own Ascanius. Down at his feet he flings the useless helmet, the one he donned when he played at war, acting out mock battles. They won't listen to him. However, Aeneas arrives with his Trojan, with his Trojan troops, and the women, terrified, scatter now down the beaches, fleeing, stealing away into the woods and rocky caverns, anywhere they can hide. They cringe from the daylight, shrink from what they've done. They come to their senses, line 750, know their people, and Juno is driven from their hearts. Aeneas, interestingly, will have to pray, and he will say to Jove, if this is the way it's going to go down, I'm ready for me to die. Kill me as well. In other words, he's willing to sacrifice himself, but save our ships. Jove jo jo will send rain, which saves the ships. However, we're told that Aeneas now is a little bit torn. What to do? Should we just stay here in Sicily? We have then, we're told, uh, old uh, Nautus. And Nautus is going to be kind of like Nestor in playing the role of Nestor in the Iliad. And he will speak at 780. And he will say, son of Venus, whether the fates will draw us on or draw us back, let's follow where they lead. In other words, let's not quit our journeys and our, and our voyage. Whatever fortune sends, we master it all by bearing it all we must. In other words, sounding very much what later, at a later Italian Machiavelli will say in the Prince, Fortuna has to be mastered. We master whatever it is Fortuna gives to us, we master it. Why? Because we're Romans. You have a Chistes, a Trojan board of the gods, a ready advisor. Invite him into your councils, make your plans together, hand them over to him, all, all of the women who don't want to go. The people left from the burnt ships and these worn out by the vast endeavor you've begun, your destiny, your fate. The old men bent with age, the women sick of the sea, ones who are feeble, ones who shrink from danger. Set them apart, and exhausted as they are, let them have their walls within this land. If he lends his name, they'll call the town.